Okay, good morning, everybody. It looks like we're live, and it looks like everything is working today so far. Yay. Uh, my name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension here in Hernando County. And here today with me is my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who is the Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. And we are here today to answer your questions because I just realized that this is a virtual plant clinic. And the reason why we started doing it is to be able to answer people's questions. So instead of having to like get in your car and burn, you know, a thousand dollars worth of gas driving <laughs> to our office. And, or to your county office, wherever that may be. Yeah. yeah. And even though we're conveniently located, you know, it's still, unless you live right next door to us. Or if you're going to the post office. Sure. Now the post office is right next door, so you could tie your, you know, errands together. But to make it a little bit easier and more convenient for people to be able to ask questions, most questions can be answered with a couple of really good pictures and a good description or explanation of what the issue is and what's going on. But if you send us some pictures, we are here today to answer your questions. So please feel free to put in a comment, say good morning, uh, ask a question, email me a picture. And let me go ahead and throw my email address up there. If you email me a picture, I can screen share it for everybody to see. And then Lily will answer your question and tell you exactly what it is and what to do to fix all of your problems, right? Yes, I will, I will say. Bill, what do you think about this? <laughs> because so many questions are about uh, tropical fruit and things like that, which you are much more knowledgeable. I am not knowledgeable at all on tropical fruits. So I'm glad you're here to cover that. Yeah, we do get a lot of tropical fruit questions, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, we get questions sometimes about plants that grow up north, but don't, don't do really well here. My favorite the one that I always see on Facebook groups, and I don't know why everybody in the world wants to grow it, but it's lavender. Yes. Yes. And they'll, as you, I think you mentioned last week, someone's going to have a story where uh -huh. they did just fine. But really, when you hear those, those did just fine, it's probably for a season, maybe. Oh, you have a fairy showing up. Somebody at our front, that's the ring doorbell, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, lavender grows in Washington State. <laughs> Washington State is a whole lot different than Florida. I think they grow it commercially in Idaho, which would be inland from Washington State. I don't even know if they really grow up much in Oregon because Oregon can be wet. And apparently this, this right now, it's been really, really wet mm -hmm. in Oregon, but yeah, it grows out West, Northwest, yes. not here. <laughs> kind of more arid um, areas. Good morning, Basem. Good morning. And you know, like I said, I guarantee you that somebody here in Central Florida is successfully growing lavender and they have it in just the right spot, just the amount, right amount of sunlight, doesn't get too hot. They water it just correctly. But I tell you what, if a hundred of you guys go out and plant lavender, 99 of you will probably fail at it. Mm -hmm. It just does not take the humidity here. And Florida friendly landscaping, the whole premise of Florida friendly landscaping you know i have a more narrow focus than you do it's just the as the horticulture agent you can cover all sorts of horticulture related uh things but florida friendly landscaping the whole premise is low maintenance and low inputs um, as far as water use or fertilizer use chemical use pest control and human inputs so that my focus is a more narrowed than yours. So things like lavender, things like roses, I always tell people, I mean, I have some old, um, what we call cracker roses, you know, mm -hmm. just rambling kind of roses. Those are my kind of roses. You plant them and forget them. 
there are native roses here grow in swamp areas out in the Chazowitzka. You can find some. But as far as your hybrid tea roses, your Mr. Lincoln's, your, you know, all those yeah. things, you can grow them. Um, it can be done, but it has to be your hobby. It has to be something you enjoy um, doing something out there every day with. And you have to be willing to spend a lot of money and um, inputs on fungicides and and then, you know, your rose bushes are not going to last 30 years like they would up north. You, I mean, if you get five out of them, you're going to be healthy. Yeah. And then you're going to move along to a different rose bush. So if it's, you're a rosarian and it's something you absolutely love to do, just realize, especially in the summer months here in Florida, you're going to have black spot like crazy. You're going to be putting fungicide on those things every week. And um, if that's what you want to do, then that's what you want to do. But that is not categorized under Florida friendly. <laughs> you know? That's more Florida high maintenance. Yes. Florida friendly, the way I describe it is if you are working harder than your plant, then it is not a Florida friendly plant. Mm -hmm. That plant should be doing its own work. And the thing is, there's plenty of plants that will do very well and are very low maintenance and carefree people will move to Florida and they say, I want to grow roses. It's like roses don't do really well here. Okay, great. I want to grow apples. Apples don't do well here. How about pears? Pears don't do well here. And they get frustrated. And, oh, I guess nothing grows here. Well, there's yeah. plenty that does grow here. You just have to be choosing from the right batch, the right plant palette well, from things that are going to do well. Uh, yeah. you know, with, with minimal care, minimal fertilizer, insecticides, everything else. There's plenty of plants to fit that. When I have classes on the, you know, when people want to say nothing grows here, I tell them, you know, if it's a virtual class, you know, look, go outside and look out your window. Do you see salt flats? <laughs> I mean, do you see <laughs> desert? No, you see a whole lot of green stuff, don't you? So obviously, you know, La Florida, land of flowers, things grow here. It's just we, because in, it's just, it's for thousands of years now, we have in our brain to dominate over nature rather than working with nature. So, you know, plenty of things grow here if you put the right plant in the right place. And Here, I'm, I'm looking for the link to your YouTube playlist that's on the Hernando County government's YouTube channel. Well, my playlist link is probably 50,000 symbols long, so I would just use that. Yeah, that's long. <laughs> <laughs> I would just use that uh, Hernando County government YouTube link, and then... Um, you can find my playlist. There's only what, like seven playlists on there or something like that. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> There's the link to the whole shebang. And you have 81 classes on there. So folks, if you want to know a little bit about what to plant, what not to plant, how to care for it, what does well in the shade, what does well in the sun, summer, winter, whatever. Um, does that make me a YouTube influencer? No, not quite. Not yet. Mm -mm. <laughs> Working on it. Yes. <laughs> Good morning, Lee. Good morning. Oh, they are, they're in South Florida. They have all kinds of cool things they can grow. Um, but so do we here in Central. If, you know, you just have to get to know when the right things are. Look around to um, go to the right reason. Go to your extension office, make friends. What I've told people is if you want access to like native plants, Florida friendly plants, make friends with people who have those. Maybe, you know, if you don't want the, the volunteer commitment of being a master gardener, which is a great organization to join, by the way, you can go to their nursery every Saturday or Wednesday morning, 8 to 11. 8.30 to 11? 8.30 to 11. 
and talk with them. You know, that's my, I'm, I'm only as good as my associations. <laughs> so, you know, when people say it's hard to find these good plants and stuff, you get with the right people. <laughs> you know, they'll be giving you the plants. So it's, it's the networking too. Mm -hmm. And they'll be giving you, Hey, go to this nursery at this time. They're going to have this, you know, it's just, it's, can be done that you can be Florida friendly by going to a big box store, but it's much more difficult. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you have to do a lot of um, research and planning if you're going to get all your plants from there. And in one of my videos, somewhere down there on that playlist, there's one called So You're at the Nursery. <laughs> Check that out. <laughs> Um, I did not add one this week, so there's not going to be 82 until next week because I got um, assigned a project to do with county workers yesterday. It was really only a half hour presentation, but it was hands on. And man, that took a, like a week's worth of prep, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. and. What it was is um, we county employees volunteer to be part of a program that where they get to know what all the other departments do. So I think they're going to be coming and seeing you at some point, your department. I'm sure they will. Not that I've been told, but we won't be told till the last minute. So well, yesterday was utilities day and um, we have a hands on project to teach them about the aquifer. Um, it's called um, awesome aquifer, the groundwater guardians, the national groundwater guardians puts these kits together to learn about aquifers. And we only did like um, a few of the pro of the hands-on projects you can do because of, of time constraints, but then they were, they took theirs home and they're going to, you know, look over the instructions and do it with their kids and all kind of stuff. So it was really so cool. So what kind of hands-on things do you do at the water treatment plant? That sounds kind of <laughs> um, they, You know what I did? I drove them to the water treatment plant. Okay. So I um, volunteered to drive them to the water <laughs> treatment plant. Um, and I have had the tour before, and it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So I was like, you guys have a good time with our director. And he'll take you up to the beautiful vat. <laughs> but it was four in the afternoon, and I was like, I will wait right here in this lab. It was nice. beautiful yesterday. Beautiful afternoon. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as last week. But, yeah, I, I have, you know, the subject that we always end up talking about. <laughs> I've seen yep. the vat of poo plenty of times. <laughs> but it was, it is really interesting to know, you know, how we treat that water and get it back into uh, the aquifer to, you know, be even treated some more. So there's a lot Boy, of look at all these videos here. I'm sharing Lily's um, Hernando County government YouTube playlist. Oh my gosh, it just goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> You ever want to follow? Which is you? great. Hey, that's pretty good with nine principles, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm getting more and more classes up every week or so. I, I go through everything in Zoom and make sure that everything's been sent to John to be fixed up and put on the YouTube channel. Well, the the ones near the bottom was like you know the beginning of COVID, and you know they're not quite the the visual quality. <laughs> As we and we got better as time moved along. So yeah, when we we're still trying to figure out Zoom. Yes, and some of them are just me recording, literally during COVID when I was working from home. Um, before we figured out a format like this, before it was on Zoom, you only had Zoom. I didn't. I don't know. So I did Facebook Live ones, and recorded those. But you. Literally, I'm sitting in front of my TV that I was using as my monitor in my living room. <laughs> so, yeah. it worked. Yeah. 
Kia, Nora and I were talking with somebody the other day and thinking back to when we were locked down with COVID and we were thinking, how long did we stay in the house and like not drive anywhere or go anywhere? And I think there were times where we just basically didn't go anywhere for a week or two or longer. Mm -hmm. We both agreed it was fine. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that I mean, bad. I miss not going out. Yeah, yeah. Sure, you know, um, grocery shopping, uh, driving to and from work. Uh, you know, it was okay. Mm -hmm. We haven't. We don't have any questions yet. And you know, our office answered record numbers of questions from people who sure. either called or emailed or tuned in to something like this, a virtual planning clinic, or participated in one of our Facebook lives or Zoom classes and asked questions through in it. So don't think that I've basically took six months off of work. No, no I think no. you and I worked harder. I think we, we all did. And I think we everybody here in our office did. down. We're still doing this virtual stuff and um, incorporating in-person things simultaneously. Sometimes I have to remind myself, you know, don't fill your week up too much because, you know, you may say, I'll do this, this day, this, this day, this, this day. And I have to remind myself, oh yeah, I have to create <laughs> these <laughs> programs. So I need that planning time as well. Or sometimes you think, well, you know, I could do Zoom things from 8 to 9, then 9 to 10, 10 to 11. <laughs> no, you really don't want to do that. <laughs> Gets exhausting. Good morning, Susan. How are you? Good morning, Susan. Um, Susan comes out to the nursery. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I have a virtual rain barrel workshop this evening because people still like that. Um, you know, the evening classes. If I schedule an in-person evening class, nobody comes, nobody. Yeah. But if I schedule, because they say, you know, give, let, give time so the working person can come. But in the evening, the working person is driving home or get, picking up supper or getting groceries or taking kids to a ball game or something like that. So. But yet these virtual classes in the evening, I get people, you know, showing up to those. So you might wonder, how do you get a rain barrel in a virtual class? <laughs> how do we do that, Bill? You push it through the camera. <laughs> and I think why, why people like it is because you really don't want to have to travel somewhere extra in the evening and then sit there and you're hungry and you're thinking what's for dinner. See, this way they can sit there and eat dinner while they're watching and listening to you. Then they do, yeah. Yep. I don't That's eat fine. dinner while I'm teaching, but <laughs> um, now we have a distribution day the next day. Um, usually I choose your office, and then I try to put that during like a lunch hour be or between 11 and 1 or something like that. So people can come by during that time to pick up their rain barrels. We, I also hold an in-person rain barrel class now. So I have two rain barrel classes a month normally. In June, I didn't because I was away. But so one of them will be virtual in the evening and one will be in the morning in person at your office. Yeah, buddy likes it because he doesn't have to drive from Tallahassee. <laughs> you got to learn all about rain barrels or rain gardens and everything else. Yeah. And, and I, I know that, that we have people on here every single week from pretty much all over the state of Florida, which is great. Yep. Um, I was just been communicating with someone from Duval County. Um, she said she couldn't find a rain barrel workshop near her, you know, but she wanted to watch mine. And I said, you're welcome, you know, to join us live. You can watch it live um, without having to pay anything and without picking up a barrel. But I have a video for that <laughs> that you can watch anytime. So I sent her the link to it's called Recycling Raindrops. It is basically a rain barrel list rain barrel workshop. 
Mm-hmm. So if anyone is interested in that saying, I just want to learn about it, but I don't want to buy or I can't get to your county, you know, to buy one and look for that one, the uh, recycling rain jobs, it's basically the same stuff I teach in a rain barrel workshop. It's just, it does not qualify you. You can't watch it and come to me and say, now give me a rain barrel. It doesn't work that way. You've got to attend one of my live workshops for that. And um, compost bins. We're Carmen still working tells, on that. <laughs> Carmen tells me they're on order. We hear that a lot lately about many things. I have just been mm-hmm. very lucky that the rain barrels, um, I mean, I've stayed ahead of them. So, and that's at the actual prompting of my boss, wasn't even my thought, you know, just stay. Let's keep ordering, even though we didn't need any, let's order some more because number one, so the price doesn't go through the roof. And also, so we have a bunch in case there are distribution issues. So I have a bunch of rain barrels. (laughs) The compost bins are on order and we've got a nice long waiting list. So whenever they come in, we're going to probably have at least two, maybe three classes for you and Carmen for those people to catch up. So, well, if I you run out, can't that. you just use big pickle barrels and get an electric drill? I'm sure uh, they have rain barrels behind your building in the sun to, uh, to work on them. Of rain barrels, um, sure. if somebody wants to do that on their own, we have a link to show you how to build your own rain barrel from the Southwest Florida Water Management District. So you do have a question up there from Joelle. We got a couple questions here, so... Um, well, Joelle asks, I've got an indoor plant question today. How do I make the leaves look shiny safely? That sounds think, Florida friendly. No, it doesn't. I think people, um, people just, um, they don't put anything specifically on them. Um, you know, those soft cloths that you they give you to wash you know clean your glasses and stuff with mm-hmm. i bet you if you just use those and just depending on what kind of leaves you know just gently rub them i don't know I that, that i know they do make a, a spray leaf shine product and i do not i've never heard that it's dangerous or damaging to your plants so that should be safe to use yeah if they're already waxy leaves though just kind of brushing them should yeah that. read the directions and make sure that the plant that you're using it on it's okay to use that product on a couple things that you don't want to use you really don't want to use rubbing alcohol because that's gonna dry it out damage yeah. the surface of a leaf and probably damage your plant and you don't want to use any kind of cleaner like uh windex or spray cleaner because a lot of those have either alcohol in them or bleach or harsh mm-hmm. chemicals uh, you know, dish soap, dish detergent. Well, really, there is no dish soap anymore. It's all dish detergent. And everybody loves to use that for um, pest control outside. That can be very, very damaging to a lot of different plants. Sure. Depending. Depending on because the plant, how hot it is, how hot it is. Yeah. Their job is to cut out the, you know, the liquidy greasy stuff and some of that is needed in your leaves to help them grow Mm -hmm. so the leaf shine product that you get at walmart or home depot or lowe's or lawn and garden center read the directions read the label first because the label if it's if there's plants you can't use it on it's going to list them but that should be safe to use and deb has a problem with rats she said, having a rat issue, chickens next door with lots of chicken feed on the ground. That will attract rats. Mm-hmm. And as long as there's lots of chicken feed on the ground, you will keep attracting rats. You know, you really do not want to put rat poison out. Oh, no. Because no. what happens is rats eat it. They get sick, they're stumbling around, and then a hawk or an owl is going to eat it. And it will kill the hawk or the owl that eats it. And we do not want to do that. There are rat traps. And you're probably thinking the old-fashioned rat traps with a little metal. You have to bend back. And if you're not careful, it snaps. 
And if it hits your finger, it could break your finger. Mm -hmm. They make new ones now. It's plastic. And at one end, you grab it and you squeeze and that opens the jaw and it clicks and it's, it seems much safer and easier to use. So look online, buy yourself a bunch of um, safe to use modern day rat traps. <clears throat> Rats love peanut butter and maraschino cherries. They like lots of, they obviously like chicken that feet. That sounds too. expensive. <laughs> yeah, just give them the cheap peanut butter. Yeah, I'm not stuff. giving them my cherries, no. <laughs> they love maraschino cherries. <laughs> And if you're diligent with well, trapping the rats, Shirley Temples. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to give them cocktails, just the maraschino cherry that goes into a cocktail. And um, that would be effective also. If you do that, make sure you go outside and check them very, very, very early in the morning. You don't want other animals getting into it or anything else. Uh, obviously, the safest thing to do is to eliminate the food source and what's attracting them. It's kind of hard to do though, if it's your neighbor. Um, you have a neighbor with chickens, they're gonna keep the chickens. If That's you have kind dogs, of a situation to be in. If you have dogs, of course, don't leave your dogs outside, especially, you know, in this heat. But if they go outside often, um, that will discourage the rats from coming around. I mean, obviously cats would, but we don't want cats outside either so no no cats are animals but they're not wild animals they don't like to live outdoors lots of diseases obviously um coyotes and other predators so that's never a good idea yeah if the coyotes are around you might not have as many rats but then the neighbor would be unhappy because they wouldn't have as many chickens either so <laughs> i see Teresa is here with us today so she's diligently yes. looking up the edis docs to to share the links for Ah, uh, yes, and Deb said that her black racer disappeared and now she has rats. That is a good segue that people get very, very, very upset saying they don't want snakes. Let me tell you, I would have snakes any day rather than, than rats. Um, and I don't know how to tell you how to relocate or, or attract snakes to your yard. Um, but anytime you have some, you know, a non-venomous snake, which is the majority of them, mm -hmm. you know, they're taking up a niche that a venomous snake uh, might take up. So hopefully, what, with that, that food source of the rats, you will eventually attract, you know, some a couple of predators as well. Um, I don't know where you live. Um, if you are allowed to discharge a firearm, I'm not telling you to shoot the rats and telling you to scare them, you know, <laughs> um, if you see them around. So, yeah, and unfortunately there, there's not any good answers. And Teresa says snakes are nature's best pest control, but please don't go just like buy a python and go <laughs> put it in your yard or any, you know, don't, I think just wait because with that ready food source, some snakes are going to show up. Other predators are going to show up. The owls, um, birds of prey. You can do things, of course, to keep it away from your home. You don't want them figuring out how to get in your house at all. So um, one of the things when we had some kind of critter in the attic um, that really, really helped the most and it was a really simple thing because the guy said, this is well, this is like the forgotten entryway. There's an opening um, at your air conditioner, you like mm -hmm. from the, the ductwork or whatever into your home. There is literally like a wide open entryway like through this PVC. So all you have to do is get some hardware cloth and attach that on there. So do that while you have those rats running around outside to make sure and look for any other openings into your home. And yeah, good. of course, hawks can be helpful. Birds of prey can be helpful with reducing the number of mice and rats. Mm -hmm. And we have woods, you know, around us at the moment. And, you know, there are things scurrying around in there. And 
my husband was telling me because he was clearing that one lot that he has um he wasn't sure whether it was a field mouse or a rat because he never really sees but like the tail or something and like we're just saying it's a field mouse. That's all that I want to hear. It is a field mouse. <laughs> They're they out there, and everybody has them in their neighborhood. So don't think, you know, if I do this, I'm going to attract rats. They're already out there. You just don't want to attract huge numbers of them. And to and make sure they're not interested in your yard. Mm -hmm. um, if you have fruit trees or something make sure you pick the you know the fruit up off the ground make sure you don't have um entryways into your house via any kind of tree limbs so you know it's all those things you got to check out to you know if they want to be over there with chickens have them make your yard be of zero interest mm -hmm. to them and joelle says she's watching from largo and she has three rain barrels, which are great because I have soft water at the house and only one of my hoses isn't impacted by the setup. <laughs> and Lee's waiting for some more rain. Yes, and it's a good idea. Barrel. I tell people this um, in the springtime when we're not getting a lot of rain is a the great time. You should really drain and clean your rain barrel about once a year. Um, and, you know, with a little bit of bleach, if you don't like bleach, you can use vinegar. You can use just good old elbow grease, scrub it out and get ready to start again. I've only ever had one phone call and that was recently where somebody told me her rain barrel water smelled rancid and pretty much figured out because our spigot holes are, you know, up high enough for a watering can or a bucket to fit under. So it doesn't really drain, the, you know, under the spigot. Mm -hmm. So that's what was left there, and she hadn't ever drained it. So I'm like, oh, yeah, dump that out, clean it, and then you should be good to go from there. Okay, if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to go ahead and share them. You know, I downloaded those pictures that we took the other day when we took a um, soil oh, yeah. sample. Yeah. Yeah. And I even still have it here. I'm letting it dry out because it was pretty wet Yeah, it was when I wet. took it. So I'm going to have to let it dry out. I'm going to spread it out on a piece of paper in the other room. And I don't know if my soil, I don't think mine was terribly wet. What we did, and this idea was birthed at one of our virtual plant clinics. And, um, we're doing an experiment and we had someone volunteer uh, who emailed Dr. Lester and said, use my yard. We, our idea was we're taking a <laughs> um, soil sample from a home. Her home has been built less than six months. So that fill dirt is pretty new. She had the most beautiful Bahia lawn I've seen in a long time. It looked very good. Um, I did have a couple of recommendations to make. Yeah. It looked really good because it had been put in, It and I didn't even ask how long the house, did you ask her how long the house had been there, how long the lawn was in? Um, I think she had given us a, a date when she first emailed you, and it, so it's been about only like six months or so. That she yeah, yeah, that's about what it looked like, less than a year. And the lawn looked really good but it looked like she was cutting it a little bit too short. So and ideally- yeah, when, I, when I pulled up, Bill was actually <laughs> moving her lawnmower blade up as high as it can go. So, cause I wrote down the wrong address somehow or another, I got the numbers mixed up. And so my, uh, you know, GPS can't help you with that. So <laughs> yeah. what I did was just drive up and down the road till I saw Bill. So. <laughs> But all you need to take a soil sample to get a soil test is basically a bucket and a little hard to see what's in my right hand, but it's just a trowel. So, you know, that's yep. really and all we need. the other experiment, we have that one, which is brand new fill dirt. And then I took some from my yard, which is 17-year-old fill dirt. 
And then that new lot that we bought is native soil. So we're going to send all three of those samples to the university to test the differences in pH and the other nutrients. And I think the point of this is to show that people move here, you know, or they just build a new house and we throw that sod down and the other builder plants on top of soil that is crap basically and then people no, that's well, pretty accurate. yeah and people get upset and, or think that's why they say nothing grows in florida sure nothing grows on this barren soil that you have and it takes time and effort to make that happen and eventually we're going to segue that into hopefully what i would like to see for the future is it just be standard practice to put down um, compost on top of that uh, fill dirt before they put down sod. That's our ultimate goal to help improve that soil. Yeah, and that would um, save a lot of people a lot of money, aggravation, uh, reduce the amount of water and chemicals people are using. So you see, you just kind of push the grass and the grass clippings and everything on the surface out of the way and use your trowel to dig up samples. We stopped at what, three or four spots around the yard? At least, yeah. Yeah, and through just a scoop. And we the kept bucket. putting the divots back nicely so not to destroy her lawn. Yeah, but you just throw it into a bucket, mix it up, and then that's what you're gonna take your sample from. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I noticed, and this turned out to be a really good picture. Um, Why, thank I you. told her she <laughs> needed to sharpen her lawnmower blades. Because if you look very, very closely at those blades of grass that she has a behave lawn, you'll see the edges are ragged and jaggedy and brown. And I didn't notice that she has a lot of um, um brown spots on that oh gosh what's the name of that disease it's we see it on saint augustine every summer but the brown it's spotting really on the blades is from dull lawnmower blades because mm -hmm. it ends up ripping the blades and not slicing well, them. and behavior grass is tough behavior grass is a tough literally physically you know a tough blade of grass so it is hard on those blades. So when you have the grass, even though we recommend it most, you know, it's the most recommended long grass that we um, tell people to get as far as maintenance, but it is, it's a rough and tough grass that is hard on those blades. So you have to sharpen it. I'd say at least every other cutting probably. Yeah. 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 So once a year or once every five years, isn't nearly often enough. Mm -hmm. And you can tell from looking at your grass after you cut it, are the blades like sliced cleanly or are they all ripped and jagged? Because I could tell by just standing there looking at her lawn that the edges were looking pretty jagged. Long term, that's going to be bad. That's going to let a lot of um, pathogens in the grass blades. And... A sharp blade cuts, a dull blade tears. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were you know, on your own skin, if you have to have a surgery, you want to clean cut. You don't want just you know, it ripped off. So same thing with the plant. And that applies mm -hmm. in the kitchen also. You had a great photographer there, Bill. Yeah, you. no, that picture turned out really good. And that's a really good example um, with Bahia. We see it in St. Augustine a lot. And with St. Augustine, if you're using dull blades, you get a lot more disease problems. Bahia, you rarely see serious disease problems, but this shows that you will get fungal diseases if you start just tearing those blades of grass with dull lawnmower blades. And that was really nice of that listener to offer us her new yard. And it looked mm -hmm. looked like, you know, she's, she's going on the right track, you know, she, and after we send the samples off and get the uh, results back, we'll put together something. We'll do a video. We'll do a class. We'll mention it here on the virtual plant clinic. Mm -hmm. And you could tell the difference, though, in color in the two soils I gave you 
Um, I think actually the the yard yard with the field dirt was a little bit darker, but a little more orangey because that field dirt is still that we orange weird color. Yeah. Than the native sand. So. <clears throat> And my husband reminded me to go in the back where the trees still are because in the front, I wouldn't, it, <laughs> we had a, um, they dug a ditch in front of our yard and put the big pile in the other lot. And then eventually that was smoothed out. So I stayed away from that area and went back to where I knew it had never been touched. So we'll see, it'd be interesting. See what pH difference there is. So there's a lot of pine trees in that um, lot that we bought. I mean, it is basically, what's the word? Um, John Burnett used it, like the forest floor <laughs> when there's a whole lot of it. Um, I can't remember. There's a nice word for it, but you mean, you know, when you're going, <laughs> no, soft, actually. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of organic material before you even reach the sand. So. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see if between the oaks and the pine needles, if that lowers the pH there at all or significantly, that'd be another thing to look at. Yeah, because you're awfully close to the coast also, which makes a difference. Yeah, which means it would be higher. Yes. Mm -hmm. At one point, my, my house was part of the Gulf. You know, a million years ago, but I mean, it was the land yeah. there was, was part of the Gulf. It, they probably went to like Sunshine Grove Road or something. So, yeah, because we have, I mean, here in Hernando County, a huge mixture of soil types and pHs. I know Hernando Beach, every time I get a sample from there, sky high, it's dredge. Well, in, because in Hernando Beach, like we said before, God didn't create Hernando That's Beach. That's what I say. Yeah, God didn't yeah. create Hernando Beach. We did. So yeah. it's nothing but sand and ground up seashells. And a pH of, it could be 8.5. Yeah. And you really can't grow Bahia grass there. And not much you can do about that. Right. Because Bahia needs a pH ideally of 5.5. 8.5 is too high. Your lawn... You can have a behavior law, but it's always going to look pretty terrible. I think you need to look at uh, a whole lot of container gardening if you're out there. <laughs> landscape rock. Yeah. I like yeah. landscape rock. Light landscape. <laughs> yeah, I know. A little bit, yes. But there are other, there are bunch grasses. Oh, doing sunflower. You know, there are things also that grow on the coast and, you know, are salt tolerant. Mm -hmm. Oleander seems to be a big thing on the coast. It must be extremely salt tolerant. I think crepe myrtles do okay too. Most palms do yes. well. Palm trees, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of vegetation when we took that walk at Bayport. I mean, just natural vegetation right there as well. That's where we found the natural native St. Augustine grass that was a very interesting day i um um didn't realize and i had to look it up it's saint augustine original <laughs> is actually a native grass not the kind that you're getting for your lawn i mean they they took it from there but they've hybridized it to a point and tried to turn it into a low growing meadow grass which it is never meant to be the native saint augustine we found was what about a foot and a half tall maybe a foot tall yeah looked fantastic and obviously where we were walking was right at the gulf of mexico so it you know the tide would go up to it and cover it up yeah and it would get hit by actual seawater mm -hmm. and it was as happy as and it was in the shade in the deep shade Mm -hmm. But when they took that native type of grass growing in the woods, in the shade, that wants to be a foot tall and said, let me try and do this to you and do that to you and do the other to you and make you a low growing meadow grass in the sun. Yeah, it's, it's nowhere really near its native origins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. 
But yeah, if you live on the coast, there's dune sunflower. There's railroad vine. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that grows on the beach. Yes, it does. That it can have dune waves sunflower. hitting it. Yep. When I go over to the East Coast, of course, they can grow um, sea grape over there, too. Don't yeah, yeah that. and that's a bit more south of here. Yeah. I'm sad we can't grow sea grape. Maybe, maybe we can start trying. <laughs> I'm sure there's some people at Hernando Beach that haven't. Because it stays a little bit warmer right next to the water anyway. Right. So even Man they have a slightly oh, different yeah. microclimate than what I have in Spring Hill and you have just a few miles in Langham. Right. Everything freezes where I am. Um, yeah. Mangroves, of course, are right along the coast there. Yes, don't mess with the mangroves. Mm -hmm. If you live on the coast, don't monkey with the mangroves and try trimming them or pay your lawn guy to do it. It is very illegal. And you have to have a special license to actually trim them or do anything to them. We have a question here about oleander caterpillars. Oh, no. <clears throat> oleander caterpillars are driving me nuts. <clears throat> they seem to be eating any plant they see. I've been removing them daily, but there's more the next day. Any suggestions? Oleander caterpillars will only eat oleander and desert rose, I think. Mm. That a lot of people grow. Because I think it's closely related, but I'm pretty sure the oleander caterpillar would feed on it also. That's it. Only if you have a caterpillars on your hibiscus or something else, you may have caterpillars, but it's not an oleander caterpillar. The thing is, if you have a caterpillar or an insect named after the plant, <laughs> chances are extremely high that <laughs> if you have that plant, you're going to get that pest. Um, I don't think they really kill the oleanders, especially at this, you know, if it's an, a, an adult oleander this far into the season, they're making it look ugly. They're going to make it look ugly as can be. Um, but I tell people, you know, if you want to have an oleander, you're going to have these caterpillars. So you want to Put your oleander somewhere in the back where it's not a specimen <laughs> plant that you know is making your yard look horrible when the caterpillars do come um what suggestions do you have you can either tolerate them and know that oleander caterpillars will eat all the most of the leaves off your oleander but the leaves will grow back uh their feeding actually triggers and stimulates the plant to start making more leaves uh, so if you don't want that, uh, you can control caterpillars very, very easily with a product that contains BT. That stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, also known as, it's called Caterpillar Killer. Um, <clears throat> some products that it's in, it would be Dipel, Thuricide, things like that. Very easy to find. Um, you know, you can buy all this stuff on Amazon now. Right. Or other companies says, online. Um... She might have different pests on some of her other plants. I would warn you, if you start using it, you know, on other plants other than your oleander, please be very, very careful because you could be um, killing off some really nice butterflies. So, you yeah, know, you butterfly know. gardens in general, butterfly plants are meant to be eaten by the caterpillars. That's kind of why they exist so don't just go this bt that he referred to will only kill caterpillars it's not going to harm anything else but it but will it kill caterpillars all <laughs> yeah all caterpillars so you know please be very judicious about that teresa has put again a link to find out about the oleander caterpillar it's going to turn into a polka dot moth very interesting looking moth um yeah, yeah, you want to know yeah, what your happens. caterpillar is going to turn into. Because some caterpillars, once you find out the butterfly or moth it turns into, you may want to tolerate it and let it eat your plant. And now if you have a butterfly garden, you're going to have all those butterflies around. It kills me. People will ask, um, I have a passion vine. I got a caterpillar eating it. What do I do to get rid of them? 
<laughs> it turns into either a gulf fritillary or a zebra long wing, which are very pretty, desirable butterflies that everybody who has a butterfly garden wants to have more of. So in that case, you generally you leave them be, let them eat the leaves. Your um, passion vine will grow plenty more leaves. Trust me. Same Caterpillars don't weed. kill it. Same with milkweed, same with dill, all yep. those things. And, you know, they say if your landscape, if your plants aren't being eaten, then it's not really part of the ecosystem. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And even uh, tomato hornworms turn into a large sphinx moth. Mm -hmm. that flies around at night and is uh, a pollinator of night blooming plants um different it's mostly cacti that are blooming at night okay interesting so you know i have some pictures i need to send you one of my dune sunflowers which i wasn't too concerned about because they come and go but it suddenly um had this white gunk all over it and then just died which is unusual for the dune sunflower let me backtrack i saw this white gunk on uh prickly pears which i didn't care because you know those kind of grow like like weeds around my um yard but now i saw it on the dune sunflower now i'm seeing kind of this white gunk on some of the sages and things that i want i don't know if it's mealybugs mealybugs or there are certain leaf hoppers they mostly come out in the spring, and they make a cottony mass. And if you look at it under a microscope and start poking around, you can find the leaf hoppers. They just kind of live in the cottony stuff. Well, they destroyed the um, opinta, <coughs> the, the the prickly pear, mm -hmm. and which I found interesting. And they destroyed this one little bunch of beach sunflower, which my beach sunflower comes back so much I wasn't all concerned about it, but now I see it moving on to other plants. I'm like, what are you and why are you doing this? Either a leaf hopper that's living in the cottony stuff or a mealybug that's making cottony stuff. I'll have to get some pictures. There you go. And you can send them send them to the virtual plant clinic. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, yes. The person with the caterpillars, just leave them alone for now. Get pictures. You don't have to wait till. Well, actually, you better send them um, or you can send them to me or Bill, but he's going to be out all <laughs> next week. So you won't get an immediate answer. Yes. Yeah. Send them to Lily. And that brings up, we will not be here next Thursday. I'll be returning from the beach, going to the beach camping for a couple days. And Lily, you're? I'll be leaving on a jet plane. Get okay. So we'll be, be all over the, we'll be all over the country. Yes, I do. I'll be back on the third. Um, <laughs> we won't be here, but we will be here the following Thursday. Let me double check my calendar. Oh, yeah. I got that day open. Okay. What is that, the 7th or something like that? Yeah. Correct. Thursday, July 7th. So July okay. 7th, we will be here. Next week, Thursday, June 30th, we will not be here. And I'll put that on Facebook. We're taking off because it's a holiday, because it's my birthday. <laughs> well, happy birthday. Yeah. I'll be transporting a grandson to Virginia. <laughs> Can't you just get him a ticket and stick him on the plane? Well, I mean, I could, but um, he has siblings there I would like to see. Too, oh, okay. so more grandkids to go and see. Well, over in Flagler County, there's the Atlantic Ocean that I'd like to see. So we're planning on seeing that. That sounds lovely. It sounds hot, but okay. <laughs> It will be beautiful. I mean, I'll see the Atlantic oh, Ocean. It's hot can, stuff. So it's hot. I can see the yeah. Atlantic Ocean quite well from Virginia Beach. So you get a breeze at the beach as a general rule. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any questions, we won't be able to answer them next week. We need to answer them this week. Yep. And hope Chill everyone has a safe fourth of july holiday since we won't see you until after that yeah fourth of july is on a monday so do we get shorted a holiday for that 
shorted? What do you mean? We're all, we're we're no, off. yeah, we're we're off on Monday, so we're not yeah. shorted. Mm -hmm. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I always used to consider that that whole because it ends up being a holiday weekend. So, you know, it starts with my birthday and then I'll, I just continue my birthday through the, the fireworks on the 4th of July and celebrate with the nation. And, you know, <laughs> so. Gosh, I haven't been to see professionally done oh, fireworks in forever. Oh, my gosh. It's, I don't care where you go, I don't care where you live. It's always a big crowd. It is. It's been several years. Um, we went to Liberty Park in Inverness, and that was that was pre-COVID. <laughs> it's kind of like, well, if we're there by ten o'clock in the morning, we'll be able to get a parking spot, and then we'll stay all day until after dark. And after we're a big puddle of sweat, we can watch the fireworks and be home through the traffic by midnight. It's, but Cashmere would love it. I'd rather be at home for that. Right. So. <laughs> Yes, when I say we, I mean me, my daughter, uh, some of my grandkids. I, yeah, my husband, is, <laughs> he stays at home. <laughs> okay, well, here's Kashmir resting up and getting ready to go to the beach for a couple of days. So it's tough it's work for Huskies. Hard. Yeah. And he just had company come this past week, so he needs to get his rest. So that way he's all ready to go. <laughs> I'll be sure to bring back some beach pictures of him. The beach doggy. He likes the golf. He'll walk right in the golf, but the ocean is is loud. Well, you, no, and kind you of don't, scary. Yeah, you don't want it to suck him up. So yeah, <laughs> kind of keep him pulled a little bit away from there. Does he like the little sandpipers that run back and forth? Oh, sure, sure. He he loves birds. He loves walking. He loves exploring. You got lots of people coming to your house. Still, you getting packages? No, every time the trash truck drives by, it sets off. <laughs> so, and if I don't trim the palms, um, they set it off if it gets really, really windy in the middle of the night. So I got a queen palm right out front that's too close to the house. I did not plant it. It came with the house. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about queen palms again sometime, and I'll bring in pictures of it and how big of a pain it is to manage to keep the lead, the fronds off the roof. I have to I have to trim more leaves off than I ideally would, but be it's too close to the house. Thank you for that segue because Wednesday, mm -hmm. June 29th, I do have a program at 10 a.m. It's Are My Trees Storm Safe? So either join us at that time, the event and the link are on Facebook and I usually pin it to the top of my Facebook page the day or so before so you can find it easily and if you are unable to watch it then it will be recorded put back on Facebook and then within a day or so will be added to my playlist <laughs> on YouTube at Hernando County Government YouTube and, and Bill couldn't join me to do that class till like September or something like that. So I just said, I'll just do it without you, Bill. Yeah, we'll be at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> and if you send me so an email, weird. I share all those things on our Facebook page also. And here's uh, uh, the web address for our Facebook. And speaking of which, um, when you said that, Queen Palms are like on the list of least wind resistant, <laughs> by the way. Just so you know, it's awfully close to your house. Pluses and minuses, they are fast growing. They look tropical. They're not difficult to manage normally. Okay. Uh, they don't. Hey, Nora, the leaves, if you're watching, that thorns. queen palm could be on your house. No. They don't have thorns or spikes <laughs> on them. Right. So if you have to deal with Sylvester palms or Washingtonia palms, Oh my gosh, they have sharp teeth and spikes and spines. They will tear you up. Mm -hmm. I love trimming the queen palm because I don't come back inside bloody <laughs> after doing so. The other ones, yeah, I always get a little bit of a little bit of damage on myself. 
So pluses and minuses. Yep. They tend queen palms tend to be short lived, so they're fast growing, but they're not going to last for 30, 40 years. No, no. And if you live as you know, Hernando County or north of here, they are not freeze tolerant. It has to get pretty cold to kill them, but that can happen here not very often. And of course, Buddy up in the panhandle is going to happen more often. Yeah. They're going to freeze and die. You don't see them like in the panhandle and Georgia and Carolina. No. Mm -hmm. And though I hear though in South Florida, they might be um, actually becoming in, invasive. So that means they're growing up in undeveloped areas where nobody put them. So, except the yeah, but they have royal palms and bottle palms and foxtail palms down there that are a lot prettier. I love foxtail palms. Those are the coolest looking things. That's another thing when we go over to the East Coast, we happen to like Melbourne Beach. Um, and I just love <laughs> those are cool. They, they literally look like foxtails. Yeah. And from here, you only have to go as far south as like Clearwater. Mm -hmm. We were in Clearwater over right on the coast, um, Indian Indian Rocks Beach, something like that. Mm -hmm. And they have them growing there, and they seem to do very, very well. And they're not that far from here, so just a little bit south makes all the difference in the world. It does. It does. They can grow Royal Poinciana's in Newport Ritchie. People tell me that all the time. <laughs> yeah, and mangoes, mm -hmm. and lychees and longans and all those different tropical fruits. I'm jealous of you guys who live down there. <laughs> all right, it's past 11, Bill. Yes, it is. So we are going to wrap it up. And once again, we will not be here next Thursday, June 30th, but we will be here the following Thursday. I will put that on Facebook in case anybody is curious or forgets or forgets to take notes. Yeah, wonder where we are next week. Um, you'll be on the ocean, on, and I'll be above. <laughs> I'll be flying away. So, and everybody have a great Fourth of July weekend. Be careful out there. Be safe. Mm -hmm. Don't get too hot. Don't get too sunburned. Oh, that reminds me. There was a Facebook post that I shared. One of the weathermen had it, <laughs> and it. Let me see if I can find the exact wording here before we go. Um. Let me see. Remember to drink lots of water mm -hmm. and stay indoors between 11 a.m. and November 2nd. <laughs> we will leave you with that. <laughs> That's are my parting words of wisdom for you. Okay, well, just be careful with the heat, be careful with the sun, and everybody take care, and we'll see you again two weeks from now yes. for the virtual plant clinic. Until then, thanks, everyone. See you then. We will see you.